If you search for ultraviolet catastrophe on YouTube, you'll likely come across the story of a quantum theory that emerged when it was realized that classical physics predicts an energy distribution that disagrees violently with the experiment. Unfortunately, this story is a myth, closer to a fairy tale than to historical truth. 1900s, we thought physics was complete. Yep, we know everything. That is until we started analyzing the colors of the hot glowing things. I mean, we, who supposedly know everything, can surely explain what's going on over here, right? So we tried. We applied what we knew about guitar strings and hair molecules to try and explain it. What could go wrong? What could go wrong? You might already know this. When, we, when classical physics tried to explain the black body radiation curve, it was a disaster. We call it the ultraviolet catastrophe. These videos do provide excellent physics explanations behind the ultraviolet catastrophe. However, the history part is a bit murky. I don't blame them. This is how the story is taught in universities and how I learned it myself. The standard story, which is wrong, goes like this. In the late 1890s, scientists worldwide were studying the energy radiated by a black body. Most of it was heavy experimental work. Then, a couple of British mathematicians armed with classical physics obtained a mathematical formula, but the formula predicted nonsense. They found the total energy emitted by the black body should be infinite, meaning every time you open your oven, it should just blast off with an impossible amount of energy. Faced with this grave anomaly, Max Planck in Berlin looked for a solution. He postulated that energy comes in quanta and obtained a theory that matched perfectly with the experiment. Then, the quantum theory was born. Sadly, the story is a myth, closer to a fairy tale than to historical truth. Quantum theory did not owe its origin to any failure of classical physics. Planck was not at all concerned about the UV catastrophe problem. He didn't even believe in atoms, let alone the equipartition theorem behind the problem. The timeline doesn't add up either. Planck formulated his radiation law in 1900, while the rigorous classical calculation leading to the UV catastrophe came in 1905, leaving a five-year gap. Planck's paper didn't immediately crash classical physics. Even Planck himself was not aware of what he had done. For five years, he stayed silent on the quantum hypothesis. Far more interesting than the quantum postulate was the impressive accuracy of his new radiation law. It wasn't until 1908 when Lorentz provided a solid derivation that the UV catastrophe was fully recognized. The nickname was first circulated by Ehrenfest during the first Solvay Congress in 1911. So, what is the real history? It is a little messier, but also a lot more interesting. Just a quick disclaimer. I'm not a historian. So there's a chance I might get a few things wrong. If you catch any, please leave it in the comments. That said, here are some of the resources I've been using. The first book I'm referencing is Black Body Theory and the Quantum Discontinuity by philosopher Thomas Kuhn. The book goes into a lot of detail about how Max Planck discovered quantum mechanics. Kuhn concludes that Planck misread his own earlier work. Interesting. There is also this very nice article by Helga Krag that neatly summarizes Kuhn's book. For a more technical take, you can check this lecture notes by Michael Fowler. Though to be honest, these calculations aren't exactly intuitive. Maybe that's the reason we ended up rewriting history a bit. In the late 19th century, many physicists found themselves questioning whether Newtonian mechanics could still be held fundamental. This was because they had recently discovered two new laws, electrodynamics and thermodynamics. Physicists such as Lorentz and Poincaré asked if Newtonian mechanics could be reduced to electrodynamics. This eventually led to the birth of relativity. The second hot topic was thermodynamics, a study of mechanics and heat. Max Planck was deeply interested in, or even obsessed with, the second law of thermodynamics. Everything that happens around us, from the melting of ice to the expansion of the universe, raises a big question. Why do natural process occurs in one direction and not the other way around? The second law of thermodynamics says that it is because entropy increases with time. Max Planck believed in the absolute validity of this theory and considered it to be of the utmost fundamental. 
In 1877, Ludwig Boltzmann proposed a probabilistic interpretation of the second law. For this, he had to assume the existence of atomic or molecular-like particles that collide with each other to give macroscopic properties such as pressure and temperature. However, this assumption led to an intense debate with Ernst Mach, the Austrian physicist and philosopher. Mach, along with Wilhelm Ostwald, distrusted excessive theorizing and felt that science should be based only on what could be experienced through plain observation. Therefore, they found Boltzmann's belief that atoms actually existed to be a wild speculation. As many of you might already know, this controversy sadly ended with Boltzmann taking his own life. We do have a video covering this debate in detail. What was Planck's position in this debate? One might expect that he sided with the winner, namely Boltzmann and the atomist, but this was not the case. Planck believed that the second law should be valid without exception. Because Boltzmann's interpretation suggested that entropy increases only with high probability, Planck rejected it, along with the atomic hypothesis on which it was based. Instead, he considered thermodynamics to be more fundamental than Boltzmann's statistical mechanics, a common sentiment at the time. However, Planck slowly started to appreciate the power of Boltzmann's approach. And this brings us to the problem of blackbody radiation, and in particular, to Berlin. By the aufgabe, these Gesetze I was greatly impressed by Ludwig Boltzmann's ideas, by which I was guided when formulating the laws I discovered during my experiments. He described entropy as the logarithm of the probability of the state of gases, starting from the atomic theory approach. Berlin, at the end of the 19th century, became a hotspot for the study of thermodynamics. This rise was likely due to the strong scientific initiatives from the Kaiser, the government and industry. Some even go as far as saying that modern physics was born here. Indeed, quantum mechanics and general relativity were developed here. In 1889, Max Planck was appointed as professor of theoretical physics at the University of Berlin. Theoretical physics was a rare breed then. Instead, experimental physics was considered highly. However, Planck's position was one of the most prestigious academic positions in Germany, and he held it until his retirement. In Berlin, Planck joined the legacy of great scientists such as Rudolf Clausius, Kirchhoff, and Helmholtz, all of whom were world experts in heat and thermodynamics. Among them, Kirchhoff, in 1860, started the field of blackbody radiation and argued that it possesses a fundamental role. Kirchhoff had recently discovered that the frequency at which a material absorbs radiation is the same as the frequency at which it emits radiation. He knew that at any given temperature, the ratio of emissive power to absorptive power is the same for all bodies. Kirchhoff then imagined an object that absorbed all of the radiation falling upon it. He called this black body, and its absorptive power would be exactly one. Note that this means the black body would also be an excellent emitter. I know it sounds paradoxical. Kirchhoff concluded that for any material in thermal equilibrium, the ratio of emissive to absorptive power is a function dependent only on the frequency and temperature. This is quite a remarkable statement as it implies the function is independent of the details of the body, such as its shape, size, or material composition. In the paper, he introduced a special kind of object with absorptive power one. He called it a black body or Hohlraum in German. But how could one possibly construct such a black body? Kirchhoff had a brilliant idea. He realized that an opaque oven with a small hole in its wall would serve as an excellent absorber. Any radiation entering the hole would bounce around inside, losing energy with each reflection until it gets eventually absorbed. And here's the key insight. According to Kirchhoff's law, a perfect absorber is also a perfect emitter. This meant that such an oven wouldn't just absorb radiation efficiently, it would also emit it just as effectively, making it an excellent real-world approximation of a black body. Indeed, such a whole ROM can even be constructed from cardboard, as shown by Purcell's black body box, a whole ROM demonstrator. Kirchhoff, in 1859, then challenged both theorists and experimentalists to measure and determine this universal function. Little did he know that his challenge would lead directly to the birth of quantum theory 40 years later. Contrary to what one might expect, the black body isn't necessarily black. 
Rather than being dark, a black body emits a rich and continuous spectrum. Stars, despite not being enclosed in boxes, serve as excellent black body approximations, and so do hot metal bars and bulb filaments. Many objects emit light, like imperfect black bodies. The most prominent among them is, of course, our sun. Its spectrum, first measured in the early 19th century by Fraunhofer, is well approximated by that of a black body of temperature between 5,500 and 6,000 Kelvin. It does display deviations from it, the so-called Fraunhofer line, but it is indisputable that, although very dissimilar from an oven with a tiny hole, the sun qualifies as an imperfect black body. This observation hints at what a black body really is, a body with a rich energy spectrum capable of exciting light across all frequencies through thermalization. The most perfect black body spectrum ever observed is the one from a cosmic microwave background, CMB, that originates from photons emitted when our universe was just born. Interestingly, these CMBs are also present in the old TV static. Since the CMB is a black body, it has a broad spectrum, including lower radio frequencies that overlap with TV signals. Old TV antennas could pick up some of these microwave signals, which would then appear as static noise. So if you ever watched an old CRT TV and saw static, you were also seeing the echo of the Big Bang. Enough of Big Bang. Let's head back to Berlin. In 1895, the Berlin government tasked local scientists to determine which type of street lighting would be more economical, electricity or gas. To study the luminous intensity of lights, these scientists built a blackbody radiator with such unparalleled precision that they uncovered inconsistencies in the classical world. It was the most spectacular experimental success of the Berlin physicists. The first important progress toward Kirchhoff's challenge came in 1896, when Wien discovered a radiation law that had a very convincing agreement with the precise measurements conducted in Berlin's experiments. However, Planck was not very satisfied with Wien's derivation. Don't get me wrong. He accepted Wien's formula as some kind of deep truth but he wanted a more rigorous derivation of it. Deep down, he also hoped that this pursuit might lead him to his ultimate goal, derive the second law of thermodynamics. However, computing the radiation law of arbitrary material would be too challenging. Fortunately, Planck knew he had no reason to worry. Kirchhoff had already proven that such a formula would be independent of the material's nature. So Planck considered the simplest object in physics, a harmonic oscillator. Using Wien's radiation law, Planck derived an expression for the oscillator's mean energy and calculated its corresponding entropy. Interestingly, the second derivative of the obtained entropy is negative, which guarantees that the entropy will always increase back to equilibrium if the system is disturbed. This is the second law of thermodynamics. Planck was impressed by this elegant simplicity, convinced he was on the brink of a profound thermodynamic truth. He was wrong. The harmony between theory and experiment did not last long. To Planck's consternation, experiments performed in Berlin showed that the Wien-Planck law did not correctly describe the spectrum at low frequencies. Something had gone wrong, and Planck had to return to his desk to reconsider why the apparently fundamental derivation produced an incorrect result. Interestingly, even before the experimental results were publicly announced, he was aware of it and had begun working on a correction. On 19 October 1900, he presented a paper titled On an Improvement of Wien's Spectral Equation at a meeting of the German Physical Society. In the same paper, he showed the expression of the famous Planck's radiation law. The problem, it seemed to him, lay in the definition of the oscillator's entropy. So he redefined it and found the entropy of a single oscillator to be this. From this, he was able to obtain a new radiation formula that approximates Wien's formula at high frequencies. More interestingly, this version of the famous radiation law agreed perfectly with the high precision measurements within their tiny limits of error throughout the entire frequency range. This eventually earned him a Nobel Prize. This surprisingly good news had Planck desperately searching for some theoretical justification, how to interpret this new entropy expression. Here things took a very unexpected turn. He turned to Boltzmann's probabilistic notion of entropy, which he had ignored for so long. But although Planck now adopted Boltzmann's view, he did not fully convert to the Austrian physicist's thinking. He remained convinced that the entropy law was absolute and not inherently probabilistic, and therefore reinterpreted Boltzmann's theory in his own non-probabilistic way. 
It was during this period that he stated for the first time what has since become known as the Boltzmann equation, which relates the entropy, S, to the molecular disorder, W. Yeah, the equation in Boltzmann's grave was first written by Planck. On December 14, 1900, Planck presented his seminal paper to the German Physical Society, introducing the idea of quanta, energy arriving in discrete chunks. Let's quickly go through the key steps in the paper. To find W, Planck had to be able to count the number of ways a given energy can be distributed among a set of oscillators. This is a simple combinatorial problem related to finding how many ways m objects can be distributed among n boxes. Assuming each object has energy hf and each box has mean energy u, for m objects and n boxes, we have the following relationship. Now Boltzmann's entropy for the n oscillator is given by this expression. As you can see, this matches perfectly with the expression of the entropy he obtained in the second paper. The conclusion was simple. The entropy expression tells that the total energy is distributed among the oscillators in discrete chunks, each of size hf. In this way, quantization was introduced in physics at the most fundamental level. Planck later described this move as an act of desperation. He recalled, for six years I had struggled with the black body theory. I knew the problem was fundamental, and I knew the answer. I had to find a theoretical explanation at any cost, except for the inviolability of the two laws of thermodynamics. The history, as you can see, is quite complex. Here's a quick chronological summary, starting with Kirchhoff's 1859 challenge, and leading up to Planck's quantum hypothesis on December 14th, 1900. Quantum theory was born, or was it? Surely Planck's constant had appeared, with the same symbol and roughly the same value as used today. But the essence of quantum theory is energy quantization, and it is far from evident that this is what Planck had in mind. Far more interesting than the quantum discontinuity was the impressive accuracy of the new radiation law and the constants of nature that appeared in it. If a revolution occurred in physics in December 1900, nobody seemed to notice it. Planck was no exception. And the importance ascribed to his work is largely a historical reconstruction. Planck's work didn't immediately crash classical physics either. Even Planck was not aware of what he had done. That he did not see his theory as a drastic departure from classical physics is also illustrated by his strange silence. Between 1901 and 1906, he did not publish anything at all on black body radiation or quantum theory. If Planck did not introduce the hypothesis of energy quanta in 1900, who did? Lawrence and even Boltzmann have been mentioned as candidates, but a far stronger case can be made that it was Einstein who first recognized the essence of quantum theory. There is no doubt that the young Einstein saw deeper than Planck, but that's the topic for the next video.